the line, the Twin City Rapid Transit, um, and it is actually, uh, that's the company that operated the streetcar system and went, uh, the streetcars actually went all the way um, up through the Matamidi side, as you can see here, out to Stillwater and all the way around the lake on the west side up into downtown White Bear and then connected back to the south into St. Paul and Minneapolis and all the way out to Minnetonka and, and um, that area, all via streetcar. So that was, that was kind of the, the hub, if you will, or the um, network that worked to get people back and forth across the Twin Cities in the early part of the 1900s, especially for our area. And um, that was the point of the amusement park. The idea was to draw people to the end of the tracks. So we were just about the end of the tracks and there was actually another park in um, out at Lake Minnetonka as well. So, but before the uh, streetcar company really got involved, it was, the, the park was actually a much smaller scale and um, just had a, a typical lakeside or oceanside uh, amusement park feel to it. You can see this ad from 1893 and it talks about um, the finest summer resort in the Northwest because of course Minnesota was considered the Northwest at that point. Um, and you can see they brag about or boast about amusements every moment of the day, bathing, boating, fishing, roller coaster, skating rink, first class restaurant, the water toboggan slide, which you see here, shooting galleries, aerial slides, dancing, and no charge for admission, which is kind of entertaining. Um, the uh, that, that was a big deal because the idea of, again, as they went into being particularly part of the streetcar system or the transportation system in the Twin Cities, the goal was to get people to use the streetcar. So if you came out to Wildwood on the streetcar, you were already paying the fare for the streetcar and you didn't have to pay to get in. Um, you didn't have to pay to enter the park itself. Now, folks who were around during that time said, always like to tell us that um, you didn't have to pay to get into the park, but you um, had to pay for each of the amusements and, and run around um, paying. And the, they often say that the term nickel and diming you to death is um, something that developed at Wildwood Amusement Park because all of the entities were nickel, were nickel and a dime. So, um, so the photo you see here is actually the Matamidi Chautauqua Hall. And this sat back, uh, basically back from Matamidi Avenue, not too far from Quail Street, and was something that drew a lot of folks to the Matamidi Shore in the 1880s and 1890s, and really kind of put Matamidi on the map. The Chautauqua predated the amusement park um, and brought folks for a lot of different types of reasons, or a, a very different type of reason than the amusement park did. But the um, Chautauqua was actually a Methodist movement that was born in Chautauqua, New York, and, and traveled across the country or spread across the country. And it was the, the idea of the tent revivals, like you might see in movies or read about in books, um, that happened a lot in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so we had our big um, assembly hall, as you see here, beautifully, beautifully crafted, um, wonderful construction, and you can see the big barn doors along the sides here. These would slide open and folks would gather in here and, and pack in um, for speakers and different uh, lectures and things as time went on in the summertime and they would come out and stay at the lake. So that was sort of the for first push of folks visiting Matamidi. And um, many of those folks bought into cottages. There was actually an opportunity to be a member of the Chautauqua and buy a cottage and at the lake and um, be able to stay there full time or in the summertime, stay there in your own place. Or you could tent, of course, you could camp uh, by the, the assembly hall. Or if you didn't wanna do that, you could stay at the Matamidi Hotel, which we see here. Uh, this was really the only hotel of any size, there were a couple of boarding houses and that sort of thing in Matamidi, but really the only hotel of any size on that side of the lake. So beyond the cottages, um, there really weren't a lot of options other than camping or tenting. So when Wildwood came in in 1893 with this ad, um, or what this ad is showing from 1893, uh, when Wildwood came in, it started to draw literally a thousand or more people a day as folks would come on the streetcars as, as things started to build. And so there was a lot happening and they needed a way to get in and get out and something to do for the day, uh, but not necessarily stay, stay for the evening or the whole the week or the, whatever the case may be. So had to kind of keep them, keep them going and keep people moving. So um, 
In September of 1889, both Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Street Railway and the St. Paul City Railway were given permission by their respective city councils uh, to install experimental street lines. So the, the streetcar systems in Minneapolis and St. Paul started in 1889. The um, precursor to the Twin City Rapid Transit was the St. Paul and White Bear Railroad, which was previously the North St. Paul Railroad. Uh, and in, by March of 1892, the North St. Paul Railway reorganized as the St. Paul and White Bear Railroad and immediately began making improvements to their line, which included the extension from North St. Paul to Matamidi and electrified the entire operation. At that time, the St. Paul and White Bear Railroad purchased the five acres of land from Wildwood Park Company, which was what had started Wildwood, uh, and created the Wildwood Park Association, and quickly built a bathhouse, which you see here. Um, and they actually, some of the photos change over the years. The, the bathhouse uh, grows. It has extensions that are added on and, and gets um, bigger as time goes on. This original bathhouse is believed to have been designed by architect Cass Gilbert, who was working in the area um, as he was, uh, before he was given or awarded commissions for the Minnesota State Capitol and some of the other bigger buildings that he did. But he was doing a lot of cottages at, around the lake for us in this area and um, homes in St. Paul in particular at that time. And so he was able to uh, win a couple of commissions and we'll see the pavilion he did in just a little while as well. Um, but they quickly built the bathhouse, a carousel, bowling alley and a laundry, which was very important when you were renting out swimsuits and towels every day. Uh, and the, of course the idea behind the park was to Draw riders to the area. So in 1892, Frank Trumbull of Chicago, I'm sorry, of Denver, uh, was brought in by the cities to inspect the Twin City Rapid Transit Company lines. He, he was one who could come in and evaluate things. And his summary uh, from his report stated that he considered this property at Wildwood to be the finest he had yet examined. In his opinion, it was the best at present of its kind in the West. On July 1st, 1892, service began with daily trips running from St. Paul to Matamidi with stops at North St. Paul and Wildwood. And this first attempt um, had caused a few challenges or had a few hiccups and challenges and things. Um, but fairly quickly, uh, the, the company changed hands and was re sort of invented and, and tried again. And throughout the 1890s, the St. Paul and Suburban Railroad Company actually began the practice of renting out booth or amusement space in the park. So instead of operating the park themselves or managing the park themselves, they, they basically did it as a condominium kind of thing where people would come in and rent a, a tent or a booth or a kiosk and um, do their amusement. So things changed a lot as time went on. As the years went on, that, that's when the, during the heyday of the park, it was all managed by one larger company, one large group, the TCRT. So, um, here we see again the map and the advertisement, which is just sort of fascinating to many, but uh, the Twin City Rapid Transit officials actually took charge of Wildwood on June 24th, 1898, so just before the turn of the century, and um, their stockholders and officers uh, that were, who were elected included Kelvin Goodrich and Thomas Lowry, so you may have heard those names from in the Twin Cities, uh, the Lowry Tunnel and other places. They were very involved in transportation. And at that point, their offices were moved to the St. Paul City Railway office. Lowry himself owned large amounts of suburban real estate and was interested in getting people out to the suburbs. He wanted to make it easy for folks to travel into work because most of the jobs were in the city still, uh, to travel into work, um, but buy up the land out in the suburbs that he owned and wanted to develop so that they could go back and forth um, in the evenings and that sort of thing. So this was very important to him personally, uh, as well as professionally. And so in the fall of 1899, the property of the St. Paul and Suburban Railroad Company was sold to the Minneapolis and St. Paul Suburban Railway and included all the railroad aspects as well as the park, the five acres of the park. And it was now, the Minneapolis and St. Paul Suburban Railroad was now wholly a subsidiary of the Twin City Rapid Transit Company. It was at that time that other land around the park uh, started to be acquired, so it could expand down here. And the railway began the spur into Stillwater as well to connect that, to connect us all the way over to the river. So, um, let's see here. Uh, with that new line and, and the, ex the extension of the line around to White Bear as well, 
there became a need for increased power. And it was at that point that they built the power station where if some of you are familiar with Matamida itself, um, where the Piccadilly restaurant used to sit and today it's the Piccadilly Square, was right over here. There's actually a little demarcation where it's a station, um, but that was where the powerhouse was, where the power station was built. And the foundation of the Piccadilly was actually from the original power station, interestingly enough. Uh, but the um, steam power generator was constructed in 1903. And once that was in place, they were able to power the line all the way around the west side here and through Birchwood and around the south shore of the lake and into downtown. That began operation in 1904. And that same year, they invested, the company invested over $10,000 in improvements in the park itself, which was a significant amount of money at that point. All of the buildings were painted white. They were literally whitewashed so that they could um, appear clean and safe and, and inviting. Uh, a new roller coaster was built and a pier into the lake was added to provide access for the steamers that served as the excursion boats. And so you see the steamer white bear here. It was a two deck boat that would um, make regular stops that actually would come into Wildwood, uh, make a stop on Manitou Island and make its way around over by where the VFW is in White Bear Lake and the old Johnson Boat Works site and, and all of that. Um, and then at, at different times it had other stops as well, but it ran much like a bus route around the lake at scheduled times and scheduled stops so that people could make their way back and forth. Um, interestingly, in its early years, Wildwood had a bit of a reputation of being a tough resort, a place where um, ladies wouldn't necessarily feel safe going on their own or um, where folks might encounter someone uh, taking their bag or taking their money or that sort of thing. And the White Bear Life, which was the newspaper back then in town, uh, reported that since Wildwood, that beautiful resort at White Bear Lake has passed under the management and control of the TCRT company, it is acquiring great popularity. The transit company has been given has been generous in its improvements, which have included new bathhouses, additions to the pavilion, new walks, and above all, a new and complete stage for the large auditorium. While Wildwood was under the control of the TCRT during its operations, the portions portions of the park were still held by various companies um, and subsidiaries, such as the steamer itself, uh, which was held by the Minnetonka and White Bear Navigational Company. Um, Property transferred between, between these companies a little bit as, as time went on um, over the years, uh, depending kind of on the financial status of each and, and the logical way that things were being performed. Um, so the park, of course, as we talked about, it was kind of the point of the park and the park itself um, was designed to be most easily accessed by streetcar. And so you can see the streetcars, a couple of the cars here up on the track. Uh, this is the streetcar platform itself. Um, up here and here, you can see the, the actual rails. And folks would exit the streetcar, you can see them doing just that, exit the streetcar and would go down a set of stairs and then actually um, step, go down the stairs and step between them and go under the streetcar platform so that the, the rail line would, would be above them basically, but would go under the streetcar platform to enter the park itself. And like I said, it was not, um, the park was never, there was never an admission charge for the park itself. So you could come on your own in other ways as well. But um, from oral histories and things we know about, um, there were not a lot of um, parking spaces. They didn't encourage people to come on their own. And so uh, not a lot of options from that standpoint, but um, it, it, obviously they wanted to push people to ride the streetcars. And then um, the other advantage of that is that the perimeter was never fenced. There were never barriers. So you could, the park didn't have to worry about trying to fence those areas in as they went around the outside or the, the uh, sorry, the perimeter of the park, um, the exterior of the park. And they didn't have to patrol that or provide any security to try to keep people in and out. So, or have wristbands or whatever else they could come up with. So there were some advantages in that regard too. Uh, as we mentioned, or as you saw a moment ago, you saw the White Bear steamer. Um, this is the Wildwood, a companion steamer, uh, same idea. But um, they would uh, make their way around. And of course, folks, that was one favorite way to get there as well. The 
steamers were based actually out of the area near the White Bear Lake BFW off of Highway 61. And this is a picture of the Romali Pavilion here. The Romali Pavilion sat basically where the fishing pier is for um, White Bear. And, and then the BFW is, was right or is now um, just to the south of that. The um, White Bear Navigation Company, I have to get all these names right, the Minnetonka and White Bear Navigation Company was actually owned by the Romales and, and started by the Romales so at one time. So they were um, deeply involved in the process. Now it's said that they had this, the depot, the railroad depot on the other side of their building, on the land side of their building there at Romale Pavilion. And so they could get folks off the train, have them come in and see a show or have lunch or stay at their hotel at the pavilion or hop on a steamer and, and pay their fare to get wherever they needed to go um, around the lake as well. Typically a round trip ticket on the steamers would cost about 25 cents. And um, all of this was really kind of meeting its heyday in the 19 teens. And the steamer era on the lake was ending about that time as folks were active on the streetcars and, and the steamers just weren't quite the same, uh, for, didn't have quite the same excitement for folks. And so the white bear, which we saw earlier, um, had burned and was sunk at the bottom of the lake. We hear lots of stories about where exactly um, and lots of uh, stories or, or desire to find, figure out where they were or if there's anything left of them or folks um, report having seen parts of the steamers down at the bottom of the lake. It is definitely possible. There were quite a few, not just the white bear in the wildwood, but it, um, and they all kind of had different fates. But uh, there, I will say there was a group about six or eight years ago that did a um, sonar scan of the lake. They've been doing a lot of work out at Lake Minnetonka and up at Mille Lacs and in different places and did a sonar scan of the lake. And they found a number of anomalies, a number of things down in the water, but um, not necessarily anything that would have been big enough to be a steamer or at least a steamer in any kind of decent shape. So one of those interesting pieces to, to think about. But. And here's another view of the, the steamer docks and a little bit different boat. Um, so again, there were, there were quite a few. I think there were at least half a dozen over the years or more that, that would go back and forth. So you can see the rowboats and other things that you could rent at the park as well. So um, here's another view. This is a postcard. So it's a little bit um, artistically defined or a little bit of artistic license was taken, but it gives you kind of a nice view of the way things processed. So the tracks came in, um, you can see the, the steamer, or I'm sorry, the streetcar tracks, and then they would disembark on the platform up here and make their way down the steps and through into the park itself underneath and through the gates. And then once they were in there, they could do whatever, whatever they wanted to do. So, um, Typically, uh, in those early years in St. Paul, one could take the streetcar from St. Paul to Wildwood for 10 or 15 cents, right around 1900 or so. Um, and the, the ride itself would last about 45 minutes to get here from St. Paul with the different stops they had to make. But people often reported, who were, who were lucky enough to take that ride and get to go to the amusement park, often reported that getting to the park was half the fun because the streetcars would um, race and rattle over the hilly countryside uh, and make their way through the curves and things. Uh, and it was almost as good as the roller coaster and sometimes even better depending on who the motorman was um, at the time. So you never know. Again, another shot, this is an actual photograph, but another angle on how they would get down and into the park. Um, this one I, I kind of love because it has the different, you can see the different clothing and fashion styles around 1900 or so, 1910 as they're making their way in. Uh, I can't imagine that those lovely light colored dresses were going to last and stay clean throughout their day at the, at the amusement park, but you never know. So um, when we talk about nickel and diming you to death, uh, you can see here the figure eight toboggan was five cents a ride. Um, there are all sorts of things that again were a nickel or a dime as you went and, and you could sit and watch and enjoy or you could uh, participate, but um, they kept you, they got you one way or another, I think, as things went on. So, um, over the years, many attractions came and went. There were, there were a lot of different things that were tried or started um, and then would disappear and, uh, and some that stuck through the, the years, but the favorites were typically the roller coasters. The Dodgem roller coaster was the first at Wildwood and it was replaced early on by the Pippin. 
The, uh, Pippin, the Pippin was constructed in 1904 by the Pierce Company, um, whose founder, Fred Pierce, later managed the entire park. Uh, the Pippin was a sight to behold. I'm sorry, we've got somebody. Let's see. There we go. It's given some feedback. There we go. Um, sorry. The, the Pippin um, was constructed in 1904 by Fred Pierce, who is, um, or the Pierce Company, which was founded by Fred Pierce, who later managed the entire park, actually. And it was pretty magnificent. It was constructed of wood at a cost of $9,725 in 1904. Unfortunately, during the off season, just a couple of years later, because of course the park closed in the fall and stayed closed all winter, um, during the off season between 1908 and 1909, there was a fire and the park burned, or the, the Pippin burned. Um, the October 16th uh, headline, October 16th, 1908 headline, um, sort of gives a hint of just how devastating or how awful that was, um, saying Wildwood devastated, a good part of the popular resort destroyed by fire. Fortunately, the park chose to, the company chose to rebuild and keep things going. The, um, they came back even stronger. And after the fire, the Pippin was actually repaired at a cost that was more than half of its original construction price. So if you can remember that the construction price was about $9,700, and they came back and invested another four or five thousand um, dollars into rebuilding it. The frame and several of the cars needed to be repaired or replaced. And the rebuilt Pippin was five hundred. It was a five hundred foot long roller coaster that dominated the landscape. And this photo is actually of the Pippin from up above. Um, and kind of hard to imagine. Or I guess not hard to imagine riding and, and flying through the air around that thing. Um, I'm not a roller coaster person, so I don't know that I would enjoy that, but um, I know my daughter would. So uh, this was easily, hands down, the most popular attraction at the park. It is something everybody talked about and the most recognizable attraction at the park and the most long standing. Um, it originally cost five cents per ride and eventually the rates increased to be 15 cents. So at the end, so kind of interesting. You can actually see it. Um, this is actually the roller coaster outline on the shoreline. Let's see how long that is as it goes across. There's some other things between it and the lake out here, but um, it starts back here, curves, and makes its way up and down and all the way across. Um, so quite spectacular. It was set back, like I said, just a little bit from the shore. Um, and was really in the area where um, if you uh, are turning off toward Birchwood, so if you're near 244 or Wildwood Beach Road there, frontage road that runs closer to the water, uh, and you're turning off to head into Birchwood instead of continuing on to County Road E and, and um, west on County Road E to take a right and head into Birchwood, that's really where the um, uh, roller coaster was situated kind of on that corner on that curve and it is possible when the water is particularly low there is a um, sort of retaining pond or holding pond near the intersection there and it is possible to see some of the original footings but when the water is normal it's because it's not so visible but um, the Dodgem the first roller coaster had been located slightly east of that spot and was replaced with the bumper cars and they put bumper cars or what they called scooters on that site and a ski ball alley uh, and most of the other attractions um, on the south end of the park property um, were on the south end of the park property, kind of at the bottom of the lake, if you will. And then as you made your way around into the Montemedi side, we got into the more functional parts of the park. So here you can kind of see, um, as you come around, you see the roller coaster. Uh, and then there's the um, dance pavilion, or bat, um, yes, the dance pavilion, sorry. And then kind of as you make your way around this way and the road would head off and off out of the way, um, you get into more of the functional, the ice houses and the manager's house and the dormitory and some of those things as you head on out that side. And again, this kind of shows as well. So again, this is the Birchwood side over here, which was primarily picnic grounds. And we'll take a peek at how that, um, uh, improved over the years and expanded a bit uh, with a ball field and um, some playground area and that sort of thing. You can see the highway, the new Highway 244 coming through here uh, this way. 
and then um, we've got the bathhouse and of course the beach, the dance pavilion, which we saw a little bit ago, the steamboat dock, um, and then of course the Matamidai shore all around the and city or town of Matamidai over on this side. So kind of get a sense of, of what's what. So here are a few earlier shots of the picnic grounds when they were fairly rustic, kind of date them a little bit by the clothing and fashion that you're seeing. Uh, in those early years, the, the picnic grounds on the Birchwood end were really just that. They were kind of a rustic picnic opportunity. There were a few benches, you can kind of see a few popping through here and um, maybe a few shelter kind of areas or roof areas and things, but not a whole lot, not a lot of structure, not a lot provided um, you came to picnic. And it was pretty much exactly that. Uh, here's another shot that has um, the picnic tables throughout. And the lake is actually off to the side here. You can, can't see, quite see it through the trees in this one, but um, folks are gathered around. It was definitely a popular place to be. As the years went on, they added swings and slides and, and smaller amusements, playground area for folks. And again, you can see the lake shore right off to the side here. And it's a little bit overexposed, a little bit tough to see, but this is where they're playing baseball. And so they did add that uh, space as well when they had open space. And again, a shot from the shoreline, a little bit different perspective. But as time went on, things got added quite a bit. And here you can see a um, actual picnic pavilion building. So as, as the years went on, it became very popular to rent out the park or rent out a section of the park for a company picnic, for example, for an employee night out or day out. And so they would often, companies would often do that, the larger companies like the railroads or the newspapers and some of the manufacturers in the, in the Twin Cities. And so as the years went on, they actually, the park itself actually developed more um, conveniences for those types of things. And this is one of the picnic shelters that they built that had a kitchen area in it. You could heat things up. There were stoves and things in there um, that you could use to heat things up and, and a little more of a shelter to eat if you needed to. And, um, you could prepare your lunch, prepare your coffee, that type of thing, which you, as you had. Um, so, and then of course the amusements, as we make our way kind of around the shore, the amusements come into play. Wildwood is known for its beach. Um, there, it is said that the streetcar company brought in truckloads or trainloads of sand and improved that beach. And if you've ever had the honor or pleasure of being able to swim on the Matamidai shore, particularly at that point of the lake. It is wonderfully sandy and, and shallow and, and a great spot to be. Um, and that's really, I think, attributed to the streetcar company and, and to the amusement park having been there. because They really worked hard to groom that area. In the early years, the bathhouse, as you see here, uh, was again designed by Cass Gilbert. The, um, interestingly, the uh, shelters were the spaces were rentable, so you could come in and um, just trying to see if I've got the prices handy. You could come in and rent. Well, I'm not seeing it at the moment, but uh, typically each portion of a lady's swimsuit. So you would rent the top. They, they were woolen typically, but you would rent the swimsuit itself. You would rent the stockings and you would rent the cap that had to go with it in, in those early years. And those were typically anywhere from a quarter to a nickel, depending on um, which part you were renting. And of course, you had to rent your room, your changing room at the um, bathhouse. And if you forgot your towel, you needed to rent that too. So you could rent the whole thing for the ladies. And the gentlemen could as well. Uh, gentlemen could rent their swim trunks for uh, 25 cents. And um, they had much smaller locker rooms, much smaller spaces than the ladies did, but they, they had uh, their own facilities as well. So um, it was quite a quite an outing to go to Wildwood. And you can see this is a little bit different angle, but the bathhouse we were just looking at and the toboggan slide out into the water are over here on this side. And then this is actually the original dance pavilion, um, which was designed, this is the water side of it, that was designed by Cass Gilbert as well. Uh, and these were both designed um, in the 1890s by Gilbert. And of course, were part of that fire, that original early fire that happened at Wildwood and they were damaged and essentially destroyed. So they were eventually replaced 
This is the street side or the, not street side, but the land side of the dance pavilion itself. And you can see the big porches. They, they had a wonderful dance hall inside and then um, it opened to big porches where folks could come out and get some air because as you can imagine, dancing with all of these layers and all of these, this clothing um, could get quite warm even with the lake breezes and things. And here they are watching a baseball game taking place. Baseball was incredibly popular during the heyday of Wildwood. Um, and so folks would come out and, and want to check that out. So, but the lakeside is really where folks gathered, especially when the water was, was beautiful and be able to sit and watch what was going on. If you know any of Cass Gilbert's work, you probably recognize these little turret kind of towers and the ribbon windows and things um, very much in his style. So it's sort of fun to be able to check out some of those photos. Uh, the, um, the Cats and Jammer Castle, the amusements themselves uh, had all sorts of different things going on. The Cats and Jammer Castle uh, was um, one amusement here. You can see it was sort of like a fun house and folks would go in. They had the, the mirrors and the different things that would um, make things look funny and slopey floors and all of that. And then you could queue up out here to make your way to the uh, roller coaster, make your way in. And one of the highlights at Wildwood um, was the, uh, one of the highlights at Wildwood was the scenic railroad. Um, that is, and unfortunately the Cats and Jammer Castle and the scenic railroad were destroyed with the fire. Um, unfortunately, as, as well as a large number of the rowboats they had for rent. Uh, so that was, was disappointing um, that a lot of those things had to change. And again, you can see some of the boats available in the summertime during the winter when the fire would have happened, they would have actually been in storage in the different buildings and things uh, and succumbed to that, but in different view without folks on it, um, on the patio or the porch here, being able to see what was going on. So after the fire in 1908, those wooden structures were replaced by things that were a little sturdier, a little more sub substantial. Uh, and you can see the dark brick. This is actually the dance pavilion that replaced the original Victorian, more Victorian looking one. Um, it is made of brick and stone and, and uh, was the idea would, was that it would survive a lot longer. And then you can see the bathhouse over on this part as well different view, the, the land view of the dance pavilion, the back side of it, if you will, with the tower, a little bit of a tower. And then um, can't quite make them out at this point, but there are a couple of signs on the side here that say, um, I think refreshments and uh, soda fountain or that sort of thing um, on the, as you go into the entrance. So you could get um, soda, soft drinks, candy, ice cream, popcorn, cigars, that type of thing as you went through. So the new pavilion that you see here was 100, or I'm sorry, 90 feet by 180 feet and was red brick with a tar and gravel roof. And the interior boasted a hardwood dance floor that actually survived to the end of the park era. So the, the dance floor and the dance pavilion were, were one of the last things to be torn down when the park was um, changed. So the, uh, when you came to the park for a dance or for a, um, a concert, you came and, and you would get a dance card. 10 cents would typically get you admission for the afternoon or the, e or the evening dance session, either one. So you'd have to come out and pay 10 cents for the next one. Um, each showcased anywhere from 12 to 15 dances. You can see the dance card here from uh, when Lambert's Orchestra was on site at, at the park. The, uh, it's always fun to note that there was no dancing on Sundays, only concerts. You couldn't, you could listen to the music, but you could not dance on Sundays. So you would not be uh, able to participate in that way. Dances were held on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and then the concerts on Sundays. Um, Well-known acts such as Fats Waller, Guy Lombardo, uh, Cliff Perrine, Johnny Erickson's Land of the Lakes Orchestra all played at Wildwood. It was a pretty good gig to get in a pretty popular place. They had nice crowds. Um, Dave Dahl and his club orchestra were the headliners opening weekend in May of 1927. The park was generally open from May um, at through sometime in September. The hours changed a little bit. It's typically a Memorial Day to Labor Day kind of schedule, but um, the hours did change a little bit and expand depending on the season and uh, what they could accomplish. 
uh, there was an average of 1,000 visitors a day on the weekends and about 500 during the week each day. So um, that's a pretty good crowd coming and going from this area. Our population was only a couple thousand in those early um, years of the community around the lake. So that was that's a pretty significant bunch. The park was open from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily. And the last streetcar left for town, left for St. Paul at 11.30. So as you can imagine, a lot of folks wanted to be on that very last one and uh, it was often too full. They couldn't take everybody. So if you did not get your place in line and you did not get your spot on the streetcar, you would have to walk back. And, and there are stories of folks walking all the way back to St. Paul, um, you know, much to their dismay after they had missed the, the final streetcar of the evening. So another favorite story is about a gentleman named Archie Newcomb, who was the floor walker. Uh, he's described, one of my favorite quotes is that he's described as a dapper fellow with sparse white hair who wore a tuxedo and was a charmer. If couples would be dancing too close, he would tap them on the shoulder and make them separate because it was not appropriate to be dancing closely during that time. Uh, here we see some of the rowboats, another view of that, um, the shoreline and the rowboats and the activities that were going on there. There were hundreds of boats available for um, rent during the day at, at Wildwood or the evening, I suppose, as well. Uh, you can also see from this perspective, and as you can tell, we have a number of postcards in our collection that are popular um, or were popular scenes from Wildwood. And so, um, again, you can see the porch on the dance pavilion and the boathouse or bathhouse, sorry, the bathhouse in the background, um, and then the line of rowboats. The, um, and, and of course, if you wanted to be able to access the water, you could rent a boat, you could um, swim through from the bath bathing side of things, you could take the toboggan slide out and launch yourself in and we'll see that in just a moment. Um, and no matter uh, what you, you know, who came to the park, ladies or gentlemen, um, often the boats were a very popular place to be. Again, if you take in the, their fashion and their um, attire here uh, and imagine how challenging that would be to navigate a boat or um, get in and out of the boat and, and be able to uh, swim if you happen to capsize. Uh, this lady is, it must be ready to enjoy some time out on the lake with her umbrella or parasol. And uh, that was pretty typical. You can see that one over here to protect from the sun and um, head out and enjoy. So the, um, oh, here are the prices, perfect. Uh, so those who wanted to swim, like I said, could rent their swimsuits, whether they came with their own, um, or they could come with their own, or they could rent their swimsuits if they wanted to. Uh, the suits were 25 cents, uh, stockings were 10 cents, and the caps were 15, and a proper lady would need all of three of those. Uh, there were 500 lockers for men, along with six showers, if you can imagine, 500 lockers and six showers, and suits for 25 cents. If you bought your own suit, you could still rent um, a room and a towel for 25 cents. So even if you had your own suit, you needed a place to change and be proper. The, um, the women had 200 changing rooms. So the men got 500 lockers in one bigger space, and the women had 200 changing rooms. So there was um, opportunity for both. And as I mentioned, the toboggan slide was a, a very popular um, aspect of the park. You see it here, we've got a few different shots of it from different angles and different time periods, but you see it here. And the idea was that you would take your toboggan, an actual, uh, typically an actual toboggan, um, wooden toboggan that would make its way up, uh, you carry it up the, the steps and make your way to the top. And then you would slide down, and this is actually a um, set of rollers that go down the slide, and then you shoot out into the lake. This particular photo isn't too bad. Uh, there isn't anyone standing in front, but they really had not a lot of controls over that. As you can see from this particular shot, people are all over kind of in the front area and, and hopefully smart enough to move out of the way as things come down. And it's tough to read down here, but essentially this is a warning sign that says, basically that the park is not uh, responsible for the condition of the lake bed or the safety of those riding the ride. And so uh, they were already trying to protect themselves at that point. Here's a little bit different time period, a little bit later time period. And you can see um, toboggan slide has changed a little bit in its structure, but same idea. Folks are climbing up and, and flying down. Um, and then here's another 
angle or another shot of it happening this way. So it did move around. They would pull parts of it in uh, in the fall, typically, and then put it back out in the spring. And so it would shift and adjust depending on um, what the conditions of the lake were and what was going on. So, uh, so the modern bathhouse that you see here actually um, was it was a newer addition in later years. It's got that darker look to it, the um, more Art Deco kind of feel and, and darker structure um, and was probably stone, I believe, if I recall correctly. I don't know specifically on this one, but um, as I mentioned, the park was often used by um, picnics or companies to come out and, and they could rent out the entire bathhouse or rent out the entire park if they wanted to and, and just control um, buy out the whole thing and then that way their employees would have the run of the place. Uh, as the years went on, uh, Wildwood would run advertisements and boast um, with statements that said things like, the best class of people were its patrons. It is a well-known fact that women and children can and do visit this resort without escort and in perfect safety. So again, referencing back to those early days when it was kind of thought to be a little bit of a um, rough place to go and, and not necessarily a place for a lady to hang out. But you've got the bathhouse and again you can kind of see the bathhouse, the dance pavilion over this way and the, the modern bathhouse if you will as it went around. Um, and then set back behind away from the shore, you've got those water activities on the shore and then set back toward the, the, street, the streetcar tracks, sorry, um, there were the real amusements. So you could find, um, again, the Cats and Jammer Castle, which we kind of pointed out before. You can see the actual name on it here. Uh, the Laughing Gallery, um, the Scenic Railroad we talked about, and the roller coasters. And there were also games of chance, the typical carny games where people would throw you know, a ring over a bottle top or that sort of thing uh, and try to win prizes as they went. The, um, the roller coaster was always a hit. And of course, here it's described as the giant coaster and Parker Ferris wheel. Um, you see the Ferris wheel sort of in the foreground here a little bit, an early Ferris wheel anyway in the foreground. Um, and so the Ferris wheel was often a popular site. Uh, next to it here, across from it, you see the Tilt-A-Whirl, more as we know it today, um, the sort of size and shape of the cars and things as we know it today. Uh, Wildwood was proudly the place where the first Tilt-A-Whirl was tested. The, um, the Tilt a Whirl Company, Selner Manufacturing, was a company out of Faribault, Minnesota. And you see here that original Tilt a Whirl actually being um, assembled and, and worked down in Faribault. This was in a farm field in Faribault when they first built it. And then they disassembled it and shipped it up to Wildwood and put it on display in 1926 and gave it a, a whirl, no pun intended, um, but uh, tried to give it a, an opportunity to test it out a bit. And then it debuted at the Minnesota State Fair the following season, so 1927. It's kind of fun. The Tilt a Whirl up until um, probably about a decade or so ago was still owned by and made by Selner Manufacturing in Faribault. Uh, and then about a decade or so ago, it was purchased, Selner was purchased by a company out of Texas and they continued to make the, the tilt a whirl itself and the strawberry spinning ones and some of the other um, similar type amusement rides. So uh, this is a photo that was actually at Wildwood. I love this picture. Um, I don't recall specifically who the girls were, who the kids were, but uh, the photo came in from Sally McNamara, who was a longtime Montemini resident and Sally uh, was always disappointed because she was not in that picture. I think it was her siblings or her some of her family members, and she was not in the picture, but she always loved it in their scrapbook and so um, brought it in for us to, to be able to share. The, um, again, view from the, the roller coaster up here gives you kind of a sense of what's going on in the park. You can see the Ferris wheel off in the distance and the dance pavilion um, and just some of the other rides and amusements and things, bathhouse over this way. But it gives you a little bit of a perspective if you can imagine this area crowded with several hundred people going back and forth and, and enjoying themselves um, out at the lake. It uh, seems like a perfect place to be. Uh, interestingly, they had a postal photo gallery. Um, so sort of like the photos, the photo booths or the photo galleries they have at Valley Fair and other places. Um, no outside photographers were allowed in. So if the companies did their 
big corporate picnics, they would bring in a photographer um, with special arrangement, but you couldn't, um, photographers were not allowed to just wander around and take pictures and benefit from that. You had to use the pictures um, that they provided at the Postal Gallery. And um, let's see, uh, one of the other fun stories are some oral histories that were done by with residents of Mount Amida in the area who um, were working uh, the, the park over the years. And one fun story um, is a, the, from a lady named Muriel Bond, who ran the games, um, uh, kind of managed or supervised the different games of chance. So they were typically five or 10 cents per play. And according to an oral history interview that was done with her, um, she said it was not unusual at all to take in $10,000 a day at the park in the, during the summer uh, months in the 1920s. And that meant 10,000, or I'm sorry, $1,000 worth of um, coins, $1,000 worth of nickels and dimes, if you can imagine. And then it was her job among some of the others. Uh, they, the men who were working the games themselves would draw the coins in baskets and then she would have to take them into the office and roll all of the count and roll, all of those coins. Um, receipts were typically turned over to the streetcar office. So at night, they, um, the, the payroll there at night, the, all the funds would go back on the streetcar, uh, back into the city so that they could be secured. And then um, the payroll and things would come back out the other way. But uh, kind, of a, kind of a crazy business, if you will. Um, and as I said, it's, it's a little bit tough to see. As you can imagine, they didn't have as much fun uh, um, photos and things of these areas, but the, the more functional parts of the park went around this way along the Matamidai shore. So for example, the, um, uh, there was a manager's home, uh, an actual house for the manager to live in. There were dormitories. If people wanted to live, uh, the folks who worked at the park could either ride the streetcar back to town if they were off early enough or they could live in dormitories and some of the cottages in Willerney were actually built for the purpose of housing folks from the park um, and then there was an ice house a big ice house because of course refrigeration was not a thing um, and so they needed lots of things um, like that and, and of course storage buildings for many of these amenities and um, fun things. Uh, they also had a bowling alley and as we talked about the ski ball alley and, and lots of other attractions. So the heyday of the park was really during World War I, the late 19-teens um, typically, and then during the 1920s things were still continuing to boom but uh, started to fall off a bit as uh, the stock market crashed and, and the recession, uh, the Great Depression took hold. Folks weren't going out in this way so much and um, the automobile also had a huge impact. By then it was starting to take shape and people really wanted Cars. They wanted to be able to go where they wanted to go and not have to follow the rail lines or the, the railroad or the streetcars. And so the park sort of started to falter a bit. Um, by the early 30s, they had started to um, allow others to manage the different amusements and amenities. And then um, by the, by the late 1930s, they had really started to dismantle the park and a lot of the structural things, staircases and um, other things, docks and things were being sold. And the um, dance pavilion was the last to really kind of hold out. And really things went on um, until 1936 or so, 1936, 1937, when the final straw was, um, they had started renting the park out to different managers and things to kind of try to keep it going. And the final straw was the second fire, second large fire. And when the uh, White Bear and Matamidai fire departments showed up, they tried to uh, fight the fire, tried to access the lake. They didn't have huge water tankers and fire hydrants and they are big fire hydrants. Um, and so they tried to get into the fire hydrant they did have. And unfortunately the hydrant was frozen. It was February and it was frozen solid. And they tried to break through to the lake, um, break through the ice and get to the lake to get water. Uh, but they couldn't do it fast enough. And so unfortunately, um, they, the, the buildings were really destroyed at that point and the company chose not to reinvest. There was really no point at that time to go back and, and reinvest. So um, that was kind of the end. The dance pavilion was the, the last hurrah and you see that all lighted up in this nighttime photo with all the lights, which is sort of amazing. Um, but the dance pavilion was the last hurrah. And um, 
really the park was dismantled. We have some interesting advertisements for um, them selling off all sorts of different pieces to, that they were advertising in the White Bear Press at the time. And um, But it's kind of fun. People talk all the time about being able to hear the music from the, the orchestras that were, who were playing or the shouts from the roller coaster or that sort of thing when they were kids trying to sleep on the other side of the lake or whatever because the sound carried across the water. And, um, you can just kind of imagine what it would have been like. So yeah, it looks like we have at least one question in the chat. Um, be happy uh, to, to see what else we've got um, or if people have others that they want to put in, feel free. Um, Jean made a comment that, uh, funny, the dance card shows Wildwood at St. Paul. Um, White Bear, this White Bear area was often lumped in uh, as part of St. Paul. We just kind of, it, it, we always have that sort of weird tug and pull with St. Paul. Um, we're sort of an extension of it in many ways in, in folks' minds. And then we are, uh, you know, a, a city or a small town in its own right. And then, of course, we have each of the five municipalities that touch the lake itself and the surrounding communities um, and neighborhoods. So it gets sort of, sort of complicated. Um, but it's uh, often, especially for larger advertising sort of things, they, they tend to record it or refer to us as St. Paul or Minneapolis. So are there other questions that folks have? I can stop the share and we can certainly see each other too if that helps. But uh, I'm more than happy to try to answer other things or fill it in for anybody. Everybody's so quiet. All right. Well, if there isn't. Um, Sarah, we have a question here. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, do, can you, do you want to come up and help? Okay. She wondered if, I'm sorry, we have our audio is a bit wacky here. Okay. She wondered if all the streetcars were linked together, like at a central place in St. Paul or Minneapolis? No, I I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Like, were there multiple cars attached, like a train on the street? Sure. Um, there, there could be at times, it depended. I don't know that there often were out here um, when they went this far out, but I know in the city you'll see sometimes at different time periods. I don't think, um, I don't think it was incredibly common, but they could do that. And it looks like we had a question if there was there were ever diving ponies at Wildwood. Um, I know they had them at the State Fair. I don't think I've ever seen anything about them being at Wildwood that I can recall offhand. And, but I know they did do that at the State Fair over the years. Anybody else? Anything fun? Um, did any of the old hotels on White Bear Lake survive? No, unfortunately not. Um, the, uh, there, there really uh, isn't anything other than um, there is, the, so the Matamidi Hotel that you saw the sketch of early on in the program um, is part of it is a private home in Matamidi on Quail Street. Um, still today. And then uh, everything else pretty much burned or was torn down on purpose. Um, they're really, it, it's sort of sad that of all these grand things that were going on, um, there's just not a lot of physical evidence. There are some photographs and things like that, but not a lot of actual structures. So, um, Marilyn is asking when when did 244 move? I believe it, I'm, I'm not positive, I'd have to double check this, but I believe it was around 1950. They were going through and realigning different highways and um, different different roadways to try to improve the, the, the way people could get in and out of different areas as buses were moving in and things like that. So um, they did a lot of that in this, particularly in this area during that time period. Were the Dorsey brothers and Glenn Miller performers at the park? I don't know. Uh, I would never say never, but I don't recall them showing up on advertisements, but uh, it is certainly possible. It wouldn't surprise me. 
I did put um, our website in the chat to wiperhistory.org uh, in case people have questions as we go or once we're finished, if there are things that people are interested in, you can find us there. You can click on the email or you can um, give us a call from that. The phone number's on there as well. So if people are interested as well. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, thank you, Sarah, it was fantastic. Hopefully Absolutely. next marks we can have a history of the gangsters <laughs> another <laughs> encore or another presentation. There we go. So we're always happy to do that. So <laughs> all okay. right. And Thanks. I will send out a link to um, the YouTube video when it's ready. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Everybody have a great night. All right.